Welcome, everybody, to the January 16th, 2024 Aim for Inclusion session. So this is an eight-part series about just the basic, basics of accessibility and accessible educational materials. This is the fourth of eight sessions. My name is Gail Bowser. I work as an independent consultant to both the OTAP and RSOI programs. And I, one of my jobs as an independent consultant is to help facilitate these sessions. I am uh, the presenter for today. And our topic is consideration and documentation of AIM in the IEP. And I know that some of you are um, in the new Oregon monitoring system. So this might be information that would be helpful to you and your school district as you <laughs> move forward to consider whether or not you are recording um, accessibility within your IEPs um, as, as you move forward. I'm going to, this was the introductory PowerPoint, so I'm going to close that one down. And um, let's look at the one which is our content for today. So here we go with um, consideration and documentation of AIM in the IEP. Um, as, as you know, I'll be the presenter. I also put my, uh, my email on the cover of this slide uh, so that if you have any specific questions or questions that you, for some reason, uh, don't feel comfortable asking today in a public setting, um, we want to invite you to contact us anytime to, to, uh, pro to pose your questions and see what kind of help we can be to you. Um, this is my uh, speaker disclosure and mostly what um, what I want to say about this is that I have helped to co-author uh, several publications, the uh, Education Tech Point series and also some books um, with uh, cast publishing. So I get small royalties from those books. And I need you to know that there's nothing in today's content that is uh, specific to those books, except that uh, a framework for thinking about assistive technology. But what we are going to show you today is some new information that we've been developing through the work of the AIM cohort and our partner districts in that, in that project. Before we get going, though, what I wanted to do was to give you some uh, real basic information about AIM. We've covered the basics of AIM in the previous uh, three webinars from this series, but it's possible that people are looking only at one because they have a particular interest in the topic. So we try and give you just a little bit of basic information about AIM every time we meet. So this is the definition of AIM. It comes from IDEA um, and the Federal Register. And it says that accessible educational materials are print and technology-based educational materials, including printed and electronic textbooks and related core materials that are required by state education agencies and local education agencies um, for use by all students, it doesn't matter what format they're in. So what we're looking at is finding the accessibility features that are important for learning and uh, in both elementary and secondary schools as we move forward. One thing I wanted to mention, though, is that um, the wording in IDEA, the actual wording in IDEA is accessible instructional materials. And we hit a lucky thing because we are able to say AIM in the same way that we used to, to. But the actual IDEA wording says accessible instructional materials, and it had a more limited definition. It really only talked about four specialized formats, which were print, large print, 
um, Braille and digital files. We expected some time ago that IDEA would be revised. And quite honestly, it's a 20 year old law as of this week. Um, so there has not been a revision to IDEA. This footnote that we put in the larger print on this slide is the actual wording that is being used these days by the Federal Office of Special Education Program and by school districts. But sometimes people are a little confused about what's the difference between accessible AEM materials and accessible AIM materials. The main difference is that the newer term accessible educational materials um, features way more formats than the original IDEA wording um, said. So we're talking about videos that need to be closed cap or need to be captioned somehow. We need video description on some of our things. Um, those things are now folded into accessible educational materials. This, I want to show you a so short section of this video also. Um, whoops, sorry. I want to show you that um, because it's a good summary of what are accessible educational materials. It was actually produced by the Georgia Department of Education and then is, has been used uh, extensively by CAST and the AIM Center to talk about what are accessible educational materials. I'm not gonna show you the whole video because I really believe that you um, probably have a basic understanding of what this says, but I do believe that um, this could be a very valuable tool as you're talking to the people in your district about what are accessible educational materials. And again, you will see that this video um, is just a couple years old, but it still uses that older term, accessible instructional materials. So watch just a couple minutes of this video. And then if you're interested, um, you, the link is in the in the slide presentation and it's easy just to google the youtube video so let's see what they have to say stars mill high school and the fayette county public schools in georgia are working to establish 21st century classrooms to integrate technology into curriculum instruction and assessment to support the participation and achievement of all students by integrating accessible instructional materials and accessible technology in the classrooms for all students, students with disabilities benefit from the flexibility and supports provided and often need only limited or no other accommodations. They recognize that print textbooks represent a fixed medium, one size fits all, which is not accessible to many students with disabilities. To meet the needs of all students, content is provided in flexible digital media, which is available via technology and can be adjusted as needed. To ensure the provision of accessible materials, Georgia law requires that publishers of recommended learning resources or textbooks provide an electronic version of each student edition. Audrey Tony, the principal of Stars Mill High School, like other principals, sets the tone for the staff and student body. She describes how they work to make sure that accessibility for students with print disabilities is considered in the textbook procurement process. Every time we have a adoption in place, the teachers that are on the committees, the coordinators and so forth that are on the committees, they're gonna always look to see what else does that company bring before we make that adoption. If the company, of course, at this point, only have a hard copy, chances are we're not going to adopt that series. Our exceptional children services are always part of those adoption processes, so they are able to also tell the teachers and the companies of their needs as well. There are two key elements of accessibility that must be in place, accessible content and accessible technology. The assistive technology specialist describes some of the technology included in the 21st century classroom. So each classroom has a projector, it has a smart board or a screen. There is a way for the teachers to save their lessons. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this video now. The assistive technology specialist 
that you heard speaking um, is actually going to go into a fair amount of detail about how um, their school addresses accessibility for all students. There are a couple of things I wanted to mention out of this video clip. One is that they are talking about all students. So this school is actually taking a universal design approach to accessibility. They want everything to be accessible to all students, uh, whether they have an identified IEP or not. And that's that's a decision that schools are making in many different ways across the country. Um, I really liked the term fixed medium when she when the narrator talked about books as being fixed medium, what that means is that it really only applies to one format. You can either read from print or you don't read from print. And we know we have lots and lots of students in our schools who are on various uh, places on that continuum of being able to read well from print or not being able to read at all from print. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of variation and variability that talking about accessible educational materials allows us to have. The last thing I wanted to mention as we move forward is that they talked about uh, the fact that Georgia has a law that requires accessibility in all their textbooks and digital formats in all their textbooks so that you can uh, have a computer read the the text out loud or have it turned into Braille and things like that. Oregon has a very similar law in terms of our textbook adoption. And there've been some uh, new and interesting developments in that area um, just in the last month or so that we'll be talking with you about in, uh, in upcoming of webinars. But what we want you to know now is that we also have a requirement that textbooks that are adopted under the textbook adoption uh, system or any other textbooks that are provided to students in Oregon must have accessibility features. One of the, for me, one of the um, important things about that is that when you're uh, choosing curricula in your own school or in your own district, it's important to, note, to at least ask some of the questions about what accessibility is and whether or not the things you're considering are accessible to all your students. So accessibility means a person with a disability can acquire the same information and engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability. And they can do that in an equally effective, equally integrated manner with substantial with substantially equivalent ease of use. So that's our, this is our North Star. This is our goal for accessibility and what we're trying to do. When we have kids who have uh, similar abilities to understand the content, children who have difficulty uh, because of their disability with reading print or uh, getting information from print should have the same information available to them and engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services. So that's the big picture definition of accessibility. Here's our rule about Oregon accessible educational materials. Schools, districts must ensure the timely provision of print and instructional materials, including textbooks that comply with the NIMAS standard, what, in, including textbooks that, uh, the NIMAS standard is an accessibility standard. Um, and it's for students who are blind or print disabled according to the OAR. And it, then the second part, the part that's highlighted in red here says school districts must ensure the timely provision of instructional materials in accessible formats to children who need instructional materials in accessible formats, including those who are blind or print disabled. One of the reasons I put this up is because there is some misunderstanding that accessible educational materials only applies to students who are blind or blind. And that is absolutely not the case. 
Um, we're talking about any student who has an accessibility issue. Um, so it could be kids who have a physical disability, who have trouble turning pages or something like that. Um, so the other thing that's important in this particular cita citation, this is an Oregon administrative rule, is um, the idea of timely manner. And in Oregon, timely manner is defined as at the same time as other kids get their textbooks. So if we have a student who um, has a, a learning disability and the team has decided that what they need is uh, text to speech, they need the computer to read the text out loud to them, they should be getting that file at the same time that the teacher's handing out textbooks to everybody else. So they should be able to access the information in those textbooks at the same time as other kids. And that is how we define timely manner in Oregon and also in almost every other state in the country. Um, in terms of adopting the national, the NIMA standard for the the federal law says that we must adopt the NIMA standard or assure that every instructional material we use is provided in a timely manner to get people who need it. So um, the, it, it helps us to use those standards because then it, you've got a consistent way of thinking about accessibility. Um, and we've talked about that in other webinars, so I'm not going to go into great detail. If you don't adopt a textbook that's been approved and gone through the vetting process to look at accessibilities, um, then you still must provide the, the accessible materials in a timely manner to your students who need it. And we're defining for today, we're defining students who need it as those students who have accessible educational materials in their IEP. So we wanna move pretty quickly to how do we get there? But there's a, and this is one of the ways that the AIM cohort has been working to help IEP teams understand not only what the rules are, but the ways that, um, that they can work together to include assistive tech, or, I'm sorry, accessible educational materials in their IEPs. Um, this is the AIM Accessible Educational Materials Guide for IEP Teams. It's in draft form right now. We aren't able to share the full document with you, but it will be um, a, a short document, a four page kind of folio kind of document that will have many uh, QR codes and links to other kinds of information, and, but it's designed to be used really as a tool as IEP teams uh, develop IEPs that include AIM in, for their students and to give some guidance and then also some um, wording and some ideas that might help you as you include AIM in your IEP. So for the most part, the rest of our time together, we're gonna spend, um, looking at the wording in this document and some of the idea, the big ideas that we're sharing there. One of the questions that a lot of people ask as they begin to think about, how do we include accessible educational materials in an IEP is what should teams do to decide whether or not a student needs either assistive technology or accessible educational materials um, and whether or not that should be included in the IEP. So these are five important steps um, that you're probably very familiar with if you've developed um, very many IEPs or sat on very many IEP teams. We're gonna review the student's academic skills, functional capabilities, and any assessment data and evaluation data that might be uh, available about the student. So we're gonna look at basically present levels of performance, and that's a section 
in the IEP where we describe how the student does on things. Um, but in the present level statement, we might be saying some things like, um, Nathan can't understand or can't read the, the science textbook well enough to actually benefit from instruction in the science classroom or can't read the science materials. So we may be spe specifying particular places in the IEP where a student might end up needing accessible educational materials. Once we de describe the student's performance, we're gonna develop annual goals. This is a process you know, uh, goals, objectives, and benchmarks if necessary. Um, we're gonna examine the tasks that the student is required to do and how they're doing those tasks, whether they're making progress. We're gonna evaluate the difficulty of the task for the student and their ability to perform them. And then we're gonna identify the services and supports, including AIM and assistive technology that might help the student to participate and achieve. This is a basic IEP development process. What we want to talk about a little bit differently today, though, is as we begin to look at a student's ability to complete the task required in the curriculum, sometimes the reason they can't complete the task is because they need additional specialty design instruction. But other times, the reason they can't complete the task is because there's something keeping them from getting the information from the educational materials that are being provided to them. And if that's the case, as we evaluate the difficulty and the student's functional ability, we may be considering accessible educational materials. Um, so, once we have sufficient knowledge, once the team has sufficient knowledge, skills, and information, they decide whether a student needs AT or aim to receive FAPE. Is it additional or different kind of instruction that's needed? Or is it AIM or AT or other accommodations or modifications that will allow the student to have access to and learn what, um, what is is involved in the curriculum. And then we're going to integrate that into the IEP. Our focus today is really about the, um, the way that IEP teams integrate AIM into IEPs. But <laughs> one of the things that we know is that there are a lot of myths about um, integrating AIM into IEPs. And I wanted to give you a few that we see as common myths and then ask you if you have any myths that you're thinking of as you um, work with IEP teams that are including AT or AIM in their IEPs. So one of them is if you use a UDL approach to um, instruction in your school district, one like you saw in the Georgia video, you won't need to have accessible educational materials. It's a really common misconception, um, especially when we're talking about IEPs, because what we're doing is individualizing a student's program. So a universal design for learning approach will have a, a more options for all students in the school, but we still may have students who do need special attention to their accessible educational materials. The one that obviously comes to mind most frequently is students who are blind or visually disabled, uh, visually impaired. Um, another common misconception in Oregon especially is there's no place on the form to document AIM, so we don't have to include it in the IEP. And that's just not true. We're gonna actually look in a minute at the uh, wording in the Oregon sample IEP document and in the Oregon um, guidance that tells us that we now have a factor G um, in the special, the special factors consideration area, and that factor G is the need for accessible educational materials. 
You may be working in a district where you're using an electronic form that doesn't have that factor G on it, um, but that does not um, absolve your district from the need to actually have the conversation and consider the student's need for accessible educational materials. Here's another common misconception. If you've included AT in an IEP, you don't need to talk about AIM. And one of the things that we're learning and that we know from other sessions in this series is that assistive technology is a way often to deliver accessible educational materials. But it we need to list both the assistive technology that might help deliver accessible educational materials as well as the materials themselves. So in the example that we used earlier, we talked about a student who can't benefit from reading the science textbook. Um, we can give that student the, um, the technology that would read the textbook aloud to them. We can give the student large print or whatever format they need in order to have accessibility for that textbook. But providing the actual textbook files and any teacher made worksheets and things like that also needs to be addressed in a student's IEP so that we make sure that they not only have the, the tools that will help them use the right format, but they have the, the instructional materials themselves that everybody else has. One of the final uh, misconceptions is that if everyone has it, it's not aimed. So we've heard from many um, folks around the country lately that with our one-to-one -one, um, device initiatives that happened to us during COVID, every, almost every kid in the country who has their own dedicated device has text-to-speech on that device. So the mythology the, is that we don't have to, um, we don't have to write it in the IP because everybody's got it. And the important thing to know about that is that we do need to write it in the IEP for students who cannot do without it. So um, there may come a day, heaven forbid, that where some of our students don't have one-to-one -one devices anymore or the availability of one-to-one -one devices is much smaller. But we know that for many of our students who need assistive technology and accessible educational materials, we're going to have to write it in the IEP so that we're sure that it's made available for our students who need it. Um, I wonder if you have any other thoughts about myths about AIM or, or things that you've been thinking about um, as we talk through these four common myths. So I'm going to take just a minute and check the um, text box, the chat box. And it looks to me like all the chat is about handouts and business stuff. So um, I don't know if you have any other common myths or things that you're battling in your district. But this is a good time to talk about those and think, think about whether there are any other ones that need to be added here. If not, let's go ahead and move forward. Um, and I, re you remember that we talked about the fact that Oregon does have a special factors G that's listed in the special consideration um, section of our IEP document. And it's this part that is highlighted here. So you'll see the other special considerations that we're more familiar with, um, behavior, um, let's be limited English proficiency, blind or visually impaired, uh, communication disorders, deaf, hard of hearing. And then the, the one we're most familiar with in this arena is assistive technology. But there is in the sample Oregon IEP form a factor G that asks the question, does the student require one or more specialized formats of the educational materials 
because of blindness or other disability prevents effective use of standard print. And our, uh, we have the option of saying yes or no to that. But if the team says yes, then this is the place in the IEP form where you can begin to list the kinds of formats that a student might be using. Um, I've put the citation here at the bottom of the slide for uh, the accessible materials um, rule in Oregon, just so that you know that that's there. And um, this wording up at the top is just the explanation again of what accessible educational materials are. But here's our IEP form. Here's a picture of the, of the actual page and then the wording that is included for accessible educational materials. I'm curious whether you have this section in your IEP. What we're hearing in a lot is that it's about uh, three quarters of the districts in the state do have this section G, but there's a, quite a number of them that don't yet. So, um, Betty, can I call on you? Do you does your IEP form have this? Um, no, we we use the synergy record keeping system, and it does not have the G. So our district um, makes our, our requires our specialist to take that doc that wording and put it in the present level statement and address it there because um, they haven't added it to the uh, special factors page. The other option is if we've marked yes on assistive technology, which is on the special factors page in Synergy, we add the statement there and address it there. Okay, so you are addressing it and you've had to do some workarounds for um, for the yes. Synergy system. Yes. We're hoping that some of those changes will happen soon in the electronic systems, but we do know that they're hard to change. And so I love hearing your your solution for what do we do instead that makes sure that we do address AIM in, your, in our IEPs. Um, and then here's, again, some wording from the Oregon Department of Education. Though some electronic IEP forms do not include Factor G, the district is not relieved of its responsibility to provide AIM. So Betty's given us a great way to, to think about that. One of the things that's happening to the, with the AIM cohort is that we're getting a lot of frequently asked questions. So one of them is this one. When an IEP considers AIM, what kind of data should be used to decide the student need? And you heard Betty mention present levels of performance. That's an important factor in deciding whether or not you're gonna provide accessible materials to, to an individual student. And also then evidence about the need and benefits of AIM that's of the AIM that's being considered. One of the things that I like to say to teams, and it's it's just a recommendation from Gail, not from any uh, specific agency, but is that the only way to really know how uh, a accessible technology or accessible educational materials is gonna uh, impact a student is to try it with the student and try it in the real environment where um, where students are uh, living and learning, working and learning with their peers. So database decisions, I think, are critical to um, to making those kinds of aim decisions. If I were a case manager and we got to that part in the IEP, one of the questions I would be asking was, what data do we have about how the student performs uh, when they use, uh, when they try and read with print, how, you know, how fast, how many words do they get right, what's their comprehension level, and then if the text is read aloud to them, either by technology or an individual person or, or you know, for what, in whatever way, what how does their performance change? Is it improved? And those are the kinds of things that we need to have um, the information that we need to have during an IEP team 
meeting in order to decide whether AIM is actually a good uh, solution for a student. One of the things that's been difficult for um, for everyone, I think, is that IDEA does not specify a location to write the AIM or the AT. Um, they could, both of them can be documented in almost any section of the IEP if it's relevant in that section. So there's some general rules. One of them is that it's probably best practice to write features of um, accessible materials and not the actual name of the materials themselves. Although if you have a textbook that's used in a particular class, it's perfectly wonderful to write the name of the textbook and where you're gonna get the digital format. But what, what teams really need to know in addition to those two things is what is the format that this student will be using? Is it a recorded book with a human reader? Is it a, a computerized book that the, the computer is going to read aloud and highlight the words? Is it large print? What is the format that this particular student needs? So it's important to have guidelines to help teams move forward with that, to help them just do a kind of a step-by-step uh, decision-making process about accessible educational materials. Um, this is a list of the places where uh, accessible educational materials could be included in your IEP form. There is no guidance at all from either our state or from the federal government about how to write it specifically. So what we want to do is try and list the accessible educational materials wherever it makes sense. And I think Betty did a great job of saying, well, we put it in the present level statement, and then we may have to put it in some other places um, in order to make sure that all the technology is available and things like that. Also, it's important if you're gonna, if a student's gonna use accessible educational materials in a state assessment, if they're going to need those accessibility features in our state assessments, those must be listed in the IEP um, if they aren't already listed in the test administration manual so that everybody knows that, yes, the student's going to use it in a classroom, but they're also going to use it when they take the statewide assessments. Um, and another place that sometimes assistive technology and AIM get left out is in transition planning, um, because we want our students to move forward, hopefully using the tools that have worked for them in elementary and high school. And um, so transition planning is another place where I really like to bring up AIM and assistive technology. This is also a place where I think it's critical um, that we have some consistency in our services across the district. Um, so how do IEP teams consistently consider AIM needs? Do they do formal evaluations for AIM or is classroom assessment enough? Is it okay if a, if a uh, English teacher just pulls out a digital file of a particular uh, novel that the class is reading and, and does some testing herself. How fast can the student read the, the novel on their own? How, how well do they understand if, an, if a person reads to them? And can they benefit from um, electronic versions of that same novel? Yeah. So there's some basic testing that can be done um, in the classroom before the IP meeting happens. It doesn't have to be a formal evaluation. Another question that's frequently asked is, if the IP team determines a need for AIM, how are the materials and technology acquired? And that's going to be on a case-by-case -case and often even a school-by-school -school, uh, basis, the answer to that question. And, and then another question that has to be done on a case-by-case -case or school-by-school basis um, or a 
in the is if the IP team decides AIM is not needed, how should that be documented? If the team says, well, we talked about it and we think maybe someday he might benefit from um, a particular form of Braille, but right now he doesn't know, read Braille well enough to uh, to use it, so we're not going to do it. Where do you document that decision in your IEP? Now, again, I've mentioned to you that there's um, no federal guidance or state guidance about that level of detail in writing IEPs. And so what we hope is that school administrators and case managers and, and folks like that will create some guidelines and maybe even some samples that help teams understand how they do things. I love that Betty was able to say, well, this is how we do it in our district. And I hope that most IEP teams will be able to say that. Guidelines give us um, some assurances that our IEPs are legal and efficient and effective, that they're responsive to all of the students and the, and the parents uh, who are interested in having assistive technology. Our guidelines should also talk about that issue of whether or not the decisions are data-based and what data we use to, um, to make our decisions. But one of the things that's really important is that our, our administrators, our directors of special ed, or sometimes our principals, or certainly somebody at the, at the district level, um, needs to have some be able to make some resources available and monitor our IEPs, take a look at what we're doing in order to make sure that we are implemented and that we are implementing them and that they are legal, efficient, and ethical. So one of the my messages to you today is that if what you want is consistency in your district, you really have to have some basic information about how you do things in your district. And a lot of that will be aimed at answering this frequently asked question, how should AIM be written into an IEP? So it's my, uh, my friend always says to me, never answer a question with a question. But in fact, what we have to do for this one is to make those decisions on a, on a district level. So if you have an impact over how the district does things, um, these are some of the other questions that you might consider. If the IEP has decided that a child needs AIM, how should that decision be documented? Where do you write it? Under what circumstances should a child have specific goals for AIM? If a student is just beginning to learn to use a a computer that reads the text out loud, What they may have to have some goals for um, what they need to learn in order to do that independently. And then when should AIM be listed as an accommodation or a supplemental aid? Do you put that in a particular place in the IEP? Um, so once we get some of those big general questions answered. Another question um, is, if the learner needs an accessible format, the IEP team needs to record these things in the plan. So this, what is the format? Who's gonna be responsible for acquiring it? So, uh, what are the services that this student might need? And what kind of instruction might this student need in order to be independent? What kind of instruction will teachers and staff and parents need? And if it's gonna be used at home, particularly what kind of instruction do parents need? These are the kinds of things that you might include in an IEP, but you also might include in an implementation plan. And I always recommend that teams um, cover these kinds of questions in some kind of a, a fairly short, simple document that can be attached to the IEP and um, used as just the step-by-step, -step, here's how we're gonna do this thing. Particularly if the aim is new 
to um, a particular student. One of the things we know that if a is that if AIM is meaningfully incorporated into a student's IEP, um, the likelihood is increased that the student's use of AIM will become an effective and integrated part of the learning process in K-12 and, and hopefully beyond in post-secondary life. But if we don't address some of these implementation issues, um, either in the IEP or immediately after the IEP, so that people know what their responsibilities are, it, it's less likely to be a successful plan. Now, I mentioned to you that we're doing, um, that we're about to release a um, AIM in the IEP guide for IEP teams. And um, this is one of the case examples that we use in that guide. So what I wanted to do for the rest of our time together was just to talk about Maya, She's 14 years old and in the in the eighth grade, and she has um, other health impaired attention deficit disorder uh, as her diagnosis. When she was in the fifth grade, that was first her first IEP was developed. Up until that time, she'd been mm, struggling a little bit, basically making it okay. And that in the fifth grade was when the content reading got so difficult that her slow reading speed and her multiple errors in reading um, really began to have an impact on her. Um, she was able to pay better attention when somebody's reading the text out loud as she followed along. And so the team knew that about her. Sometimes she had teachers who read some of the textbooks out loud to the whole class. So this team, as they considered AIM, tried a tool called the AIM Navigator, um, which is on the CAST website. And basically it's, it's a tool that allows you to change the look of the text and how it's, um, uh, to think about the look of the text and how it's presented to the student and give you lots of choices. They went through that with her and what they decided was that um, Maya could benefit from a recorded human voice audio format. So not a computer reading it out loud, out loud to her, but books that were recorded by a human voice that she could listen to. Um, they also thought that for accommodations during state assessments, um, she would be using her AIM accommodations and um, full description. Oh, there's some text there that shouldn't be there. But anyway, so they put AIM into Maya's IEP. And what we're going to do next is take a look at all the different places that AIM could have been included in my, Maya's IEP. So this is a summary that you'll find in our new AIM for IEP Teams guide um, that tells the way that one team used the language that they used as they wrote Maya's IEP. I will tell you that we've used this example to go through every single place that we thought it might be included in the IEP. I'm not sure that that, that is totally necessary, but it, it was good to give you some of the examples that, um, that, the, that could be done in different ways. So summary of evaluation results talks about Maya in the eighth grade and um, that she has difficulty paying attention long enough to read grade level text materials. She learns and retains content better when she uses an accessible format of her educational materials. And um, the AIM Navigator indicated the accessible format that she benefits the most from is recorded audio human voice. If recorded human voice isn't available, she can also benefit from digital text. So this is a summary of evaluation results that, that was completed for Maya. And it's just some sample language for you. The next place is present level of performance. And you heard um, 
you heard Betty talk about present level of performance and how they include it in um, in their IEPs because they don't have the factor G in their uh, consideration document. Um, so here's some language that you could use. I don't need to read all of these to you because you'll have the handouts. But um, it says that when reading, when using human recorded content files or applications with text-to-speech, Maya successfully understands and interacts with the accessible formats of grade level text. So if you can give her a, a document that's read out loud, she will understand it is basically what that says. So that's another place you could put it. There's special factors. Um, and we've already talked about that a little bit. Um, in order to use her accessible format, she's going to need a tablet or some other device that can play audio files. It could be her phone. And we, um, I'm not going to say specifically what it is in this IEP document, but in that implementation planning um, activity that we talked about, we will say more specifically what it is. We don't say it specifically here because it might change over time and we don't want to have to have new IEP meetings every 20 days. Same thing for the need for AIM. So it, in the need for AIM, Maya needs re materials recorded with human voice or accessible digital text format to access the general curriculum. So those are special considerations. Measurable annual goals. Now in this particular example, we want to identify the skill that she's trying to develop which is identify examples of sequential comparative and causal presentations of information in the text with 80% accuracy. And that's a goal that comes from the English language um, standards, not from, not from our um, accessible educational materials discussion. But we, but here's another one that says using a digital text-to-speech pre-algebra textbook, Maya will be able to complete all the textbook unit tests with accuracy of 75% or better. So some sample goals that include accessible educational materials and probably some assistive technology, but don't need to mention them very specifically as long as we know what the format is that she's using. Um, here's a list of special ed education and related services, supplementary aids and services, program modifications and supports. We lump these all into the same uh, slide here just for our efficiency. Um, but it says what specific things Maya will need to do and what Maya's teachers and parents will need in order to support her use of uh, AIM and of assistive technology. And you'll notice here, there's some things listed that weren't probably mentioned in other places in the IP, um, both the headphones and preferential seating when she's reading with text-to-speech. AT services are documented when needed by professionals and family members so that they can support the student. I want to really emphasize the fact that we're, we're talking about AIM in the IEP right now, but we're also talking about um, the AT that supports the use of AIM. So I wanted to make sure that we, we separated that out because we are probably listing both some assistive technology and some accessible educational materials in this IEP, unless the student, the only thing the student needs is something like large print, in which case they could probably get that on paper, but they may also want it uh, digitally so that they can uh, manipulate the text and stuff. Um, participation in statewide assessments is another place where we're gonna talk about how Maya does things and how the rules in our Oregon statewide assessments um, are applied in her situation. So some sample wording here. And then in transition planning, 
in transition planning, this team in particular really wanted to focus on Maya advocating for her own assistive technology needs and being able to tell her teachers what she needed because she was getting old enough and she hoped to go to a post-secondary educational program. So she needed to be able to do those things for herself. Um, so that's another place where it could have been written in the IEP. When One of the things that I want to end with here is that when AT appears in the IEP, it's not as important to, uh, as being sure that it's included in a way that makes sense. It is important. There's a typo there. I'm sorry. Uh, it's important that it makes sense to people um, where you're writing it. And that one of the questions I have for you to think about as we move forward here is what keeps people from seeing the mention of AIM in the IEP? We have a lot of experience of we put it in the IEP, but for some reason, um, people aren't aren't noticing it. They They focus on the educational goals or something like that. And they want to, um, they just miss it. So then it doesn't get used. And we really end up needing to depend on our own students to advocate for themselves to get the things they need or to depend on their parents to get the things they need. So how can we make sure that it's written in a clear enough way that it makes sense to students and teachers? I give you one more example, and I'm going to invite you to uh, use this example if you want to, to um, try and write somebody else's IEP. This is another example that's going to be in the Aim for IEP team guide. And this is a student with a motor disability. So he has some trouble reading and writing. And I would like invite you to read about Jebron, and then talk about where would you say to put AIM in Jebron's IEP. We don't have time to do that um, right this minute, but because I do want to tell you about a couple other sets of resources that might be helpful to you. Um, one of the things that uh, has been really important to us is this set of resources, which has um, allowed us to understand accessible education materials, how they're available, where they're available, and where we can get uh, copies of textbook files and things like that. So this list of resources could be very valuable to you as you proceed in your work about accessible educational materials. And we are beginning to include more resources in the OER Commons. The, or, the AIM cohort um, has developed our own um, open education resources uh, site on the OER Commons. And this is um, the link to that. All of these 15 bullet points are about AIM. So the, this whole site is about AIM. If you're looking for particular questions, or particular information, I would suggest you go there to get started. And I would also just suggest that you either contact Deb or myself if you have additional questions about AIM in the IEP and how your district can do things in order to um, help your students benefit from accessible educational materials.